An Eldari society, guidance and leadership is handled primarily by those who walk the path of the seer. These individuals will read and interpret the skines of fate, twisting them if they must, to help ensure the continued survival of their craft world. But when the call to war is sounded and the hosts are gathered, it is far more common for a new leader to command the craft world, at least on the battlefield. These generals are consummate leaders and warriors both, having the skills and the smarts to execute a campaign as efficiently as possible. They are the Aldari who walk the path of command, known most commonly as Autarchs. This is Tactica Imperialis, and welcome to 40k Stories. I've discussed the Eldari paths in more than a few logs at this point. Should probably compile everything into a single log now that I think about it. Among the Craftworld Eldari, the Ayalethra, as they're known, shape most every aspect of society. Career, role, duties in war, and much more. A typical Eldari will walk several paths in their life, assuming they don't become lost on one like an Exarch or a Farsia but not every path is necessarily there to be walked on day one. For example, the path of command, also known as the path of the leader, is only really walked by the Autarchs. To be chosen to walk it, there is something of a prerequisite to walk several other components of the Ayalethra relating to war and military applications. This means that only a highly skilled warrior will ever become an Autarch. But to truly earn the title and walk the path of the leader, it takes more than proficiency with a blade or a rifle. An Autarch's mind is perhaps even more important than their hands, though not due to any particular psychic powers, as they all have a solid grasp of grand strategy and leadership that would not be found in, say, an Exarch or maybe even a Phoenix Lord. This understanding will develop often on its own, as I do not believe there is a strategist core on any of the paths, and it probably requires a healthy dose of charisma as well to ensure effective leadership. When they and or their craft world deem them ready, the would-be Autarch walks the path of the leader, on which they can finally hone their skills and flourish as generals and strategists. Having never walked it myself, I can't claim to know much of what the path of command entails, and as a non-Eldari with no military training, I doubt I'd even get close with guesswork. But whatever happens, it moulds the Altarch into an individual with intricate, all-encompassing knowledge of the Eldari at war, as well as giving them the wide-viewing mindset and tactical genius to weave a successful skirmish or campaign with equal aplomb. Having potentially walked the path of the warrior several times and thus trained in multiple aspect shrines, an Autarch will likely have mastered several styles of engagement and warfare. By combining these skills with their strategic training or viewpoint, it makes them dangerous indeed. Whether an Autarch is truly the greatest general in the galaxy in like-for-like -like comparisons with, say, a Chasseau or a Space Marine Captain, I would not like to say, but they are certainly worthy of a place in the conversation, especially when aided and advised by a Seer Council. However, a Craftworld's Autarchs are not permanent like their Farseers or Aspect Warriors, and in times of peace, the role is, for want of a better term, decommissioned, with the Eldari in question presumably walking another path. But when they feel compelled to war, or the hour is right with the Seers, the Autarch will raise a war host through force of will before going into battle. Due to the aforementioned walks on the path of the warrior, the equipment available to an Autarch can be incredibly diverse. Using Banshee masks, warp spider jump generators and more are very common, with some Autarchs blending equipment from different shrines to suit their style of fighting. This is because of a ceremony known as the Ran Lona, in which the Exarch of the Shrine gives a piece of equipment to the Autarch before they leave. It is thought that this ceremony only occurs between Exarchs and Autarchs, implying that the Path of Command is walked before some of the warrior paths which serve as diversions but it may be that the Altarch returns for a time to a given shrine if they need to do that to get the equipment. Interestingly, despite its absolute necessity and the prowess of its members, 
there are many within the craft worlders who fear or even loathe at least the concept of the autarky. Though an autark is typically selected rather than a volunteer, there is seemingly no rhyme or reason to the process, and most anyone could, in theory, become an autark. The all-absorbing, some would say all-consuming requirements of the Path of Command are the cause of this fear, since the path itself can be seen as the Autarch's guide, and so it is common, if not mandated, that a seer or council guide and advise their general in many ways. My assumption, though I cannot confirm it, is that ascension to Autarch is the equivalent to becoming lost on the path of the leader, as though they will not hold the rank in times of peace, they will always feel that call to war, and will probably devote much of their peacetime to study, training, and planning in order to further hone their craft. Whilst any craft world could have several Autarchs, at least in theory, like many of the Eldari, they are somewhat enigmatic, and we don't know many of them. And perhaps the Autarch we do know a lot about didn't really get the position via conventional means, having apparently never walked the path of the warrior much, if at all, but instead becoming a legendary admiral. I speak of Prince Yeriel of Eandon, master of the path of the mariner, before the path of command drew him into more personal conflicts. Descended from the ghost house of Ulthanash alongside typical Eandon lineages, Yeriel was drawn or placed onto the path of the leader very young by Eldari standards, with many saying he was being trusted with too much, too fast. Whether this happened before or after his first encounter with the Tyranids, a victory of sorts over High Fleet Naga after taking command from the now dead Admiral is unclear, but the Seers clearly saw something in Yeriel, and he was given an Admiralty. He went on to prove both his supporters and detractors right before long, as well as exposing his prideful hubris that sets him apart even amongst the arrogant craft wielders and even other autarchs. Though he did lead a flawless victory in the elimination of a backwater orc tribe, it would be against the forces of chaos that Yeria was cast down. His fleet actually won handily against the heretic Astartes on multiple occasions, with Yeriel personally eliminating the Chaos Lord Calarax to end the conflict, but in doing so, he left Eandon undefended and vulnerable. So when one of the dying Chaos ships was able to launch a cyclonic torpedo, there was nothing the craft world could do to stop the Exterminatus weapon from killing hundreds of thousands of their inhabitants. In his hubris, the Autarch believed that the ends had justified the means, but Eandon disagreed vehemently and stripped him of the Admiralty and presumably the Autarchy too. Given the low numbers on Eandon causing a reliance on Wraith constructs even before this incident, I'm not surprised that such a massive loss of life would be considered unacceptable. The furious Yeriel, to use the old Terran idiom, took his ball and went home. Well, Technically, he didn't. He did the opposite. He exiled himself from Eandon and went on to become perhaps the most feared Corsair pirate in the galaxy at the head of his Eldritch Raiders. In stripping Uriel of his titles, Eandon lost arguably his brightest mind and a preeminent autarch. But when High Fleet Kraken threatened to annihilate the entire craft world, the prince came home in a move I don't think even he saw coming when he went into exile. The Eldritch Raiders, alongside the remnants of Eandon's fleet, cut a path through the Tyranids, all but annihilating the Hivemind's creations in space, before Yeriel himself visited the Shrine of Ulthanash in something of a second homecoming, if you will. There he took up his now signature weapon, the Spear of Twilight, and used it to cut down the leader beasts of Kraken, save his home, and crush the Hive fleet almost entirely. But unlike most weapons, Yeriel could not put down the spear in any true sense, and the weapon has cursed his soul as well as draining his life force constantly. Despite this, the prince had taken up the weapon knowingly on the advisement of Harlequin Shadows tier Silandri Veilwalker, a name many of us may know for their role in the Gathering Storm that was to come decades later. For the moment, however, Yeriel was restored to his previous titles and led Eandon's fleet with aplomb, 
winning many victories and even helping to prevent High Fleet Leviathan from absorbing the remnants of Kraken using a Drakari fleet as his ally. But after this engagement, the Battle of Duriel, the Autark was spent, done, and resolved to return the Spear of Twilight to the Shrine of Ulfanash at the cost of his own fading life. But he was stopped again by Veilwalker, who showed him visions of the coming invasion of Eandon and seemingly recharged his soul just enough to get him back in the fight. During the 13th Black Crusade and the gathering storm that followed soon after, this decision likely saved Eandon, as Yeriel's fleets held back a titanic invasion from the demonic forces of Nurgle. The arrival of the Yanari under Ivrain was enough to turn the tide, but Yeriel and his warriors would be cut down by the demon prince leading the invasion after using the spear to disable the second space hulk as sailing Eandon. Prince Yeriel, Autark of Eandon, died on that space hulk, his infected body abandoned in the void of space as the chaos forces fled. But there was another twist to the tale. After Eandon, grieving for its leader, recovered his body, Yvrain shocked everyone by picking up the Spear of Twilight for herself. In her hands, the spear was revealed to be one of the mythical crone swords pivotal to the Yanari's plans, and Iniad's emissary stabbed Eandon's admiral with it, transferring to Yeria much of the life force the spear had stolen. In doing so, Yvrain resurrected Yeriel. The spear will still kill him as he wields it once again, but his death has been stalled for at least a while. Despite still fighting for Eandon, one must also consider Prince Yeriel as one of the Yanari in all but name. I doubt if Rain would have let him keep an actual crone sword if he didn't believe in the cause that she fought for and she didn't trust him to keep it safe until she needed it. He holds his ranks of Autark and Admiral to this day, perhaps proving more vital to Eandon now than he ever had before, with the dawn and now continuation of the Era Indomitus and the myriad threats from the warp that threatened to doom the Eldari alongside the rest of the galaxy. And there you have it, a measure of insight into Prince Yeriel and the Eldari Autarks. Whilst we don't know as much about them as one might like, these elite warriors are some of the greatest generals in the galaxy, at least in terms of understanding their forces and wielding them correctly to secure victory. Those who walk the path of the leader may not be the guiding hands of their craft worlds, but in times of war, an Autark is not a foe or a commander that you should trifle with. For now, however, we must move on. Next time, something a little bit different. All of us are aware of the Immaterium, and in several logs in the past, we've discussed the denizens of the Warp, both large and small. But I realise that there's a rather major gap in those logs, as we've yet to cover the vast array of miscellaneous creatures, not necessarily classified as demons, that lurk beyond the veil of reality. For now though, thank you for watching Tactica Imperialis, and I'll see you all again. Goodbye.